Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the table where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Manager here at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic on the table podcast today is intelligent cultural engagement. We are living in strange times, it's no secret, and conflicts we've had before the pandemic, they haven't gone away. Some conflicts have escalated even, and think about issues of justice, issues of race. We go online, we see so much hostility, and we think, you know, part of us wants to engage, but the other part of us is like, I don't know if this is going to end well. And so, where do we find ourselves? How do we uh, locate ourselves in this situation as the church? I have two guests today coming to us via Zoom. The first guest is Dr. Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement and Senior Research Professor of New Testament here at DTS. Welcome once again, Daryl. Glad to be with you. And our second guest coming to us all the way from Washington, D.C. is Rodney Orr. Uh, Rodney is the Dean of DTS in Washington, D.C., and the Associate Professor of World Missions and Intercultural Studies. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to have you on the show. Now, Daryl, we we have you on the show today because you wrote a book called Cultural Intelligence, and the subtitle is Living for God in a Divisive, Pluralistic World. Help us understand, just to get us oriented to this whole idea of cultural intelligence. What is that, and how did this book come about? Well, I'm dealing with several things kind of all at once. It's it's kind of a, a theology of cultural engagement, which I don't think has actually ever been written. It isn't written as a formal theology, but it's kind of a prolegomena into the area. And so we're asking people to reflect on what it means to have lived in a culture that has shifted as much as it has in Rodney's in my lifetime. You know, I look back to when uh, I was going to high school and into college and Generally speaking, there was a Judeo-Christian net around the culture that, at least that I lived in, that uh, you could assume some knowledge of uh, a biblical ethic in the background, that kind of thing, and it was a given. Even if a person didn't go to church, wasn't deeply uh, tied to Judaism or Christianity, there was something about the underlying ethic that was there. All that has shifted significantly. Now, in other parts of the world, of course, that's not a given, mm-hmm. but particularly in the United United States, um, that was a reality, and much of the West, it was a reality, and that change has um, put pressure on the church to deal with um, this shift. Then the second thing that's important to understand that's a part of the book is why cultural intelligence? Well, actually, the idea of culture is almost a misnomer, and the reason I say that is because Culture is um, sing- suggests a singularity to what's around you, and in fact, it isn't a singularity. There are actually multiple cultures present in our world, and I like to compare it, if you want a metaphor, to plate tectonics. You know how plate tectonics rub against each other, mm-hmm. create friction, and then their pressure builds up, and then there are earthquakes that come off of it. Well, culture's kind of like that. You get these different uh, segments of the society that represent different subjects subcultures, if you will, that rub against each other and that have to figure out how to function alongside one another. And sometimes the tension builds up and it becomes, and and the space becomes very contentious. So the question is, how are you going to approach that uh, reality and that diversity uh, that surrounds all of us? Uh, We sometimes maybe wish that everyone was like us, but in fact that doesn't happen. And so how do you deal with that diversity? So the book is designed to step into this and to help Christians think about the peculiar position that Christians have because we're not supposed to be of the world. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be a a part of an identity uh, as Christians who represent uh, really a way of inviting people out of the way the world functions into a renewed relationship with God that should change all the dynamics with which we engage with the people around us. Mm -hmm. Now, you've traveled all around America teaching. You've traveled uh, all around the world. You do every summer pretty much, except for this summer. Um, And even so, you've done a lot of uh, Zoom uh, teaching. Um, And you lived in Germany for a number of years. How have you seen the the cultural challenges uh, change in these different countries? 
Well, I do. I've had a lot of relationships with a lot of different parts of the world. Uh, I've lived in Germany for four years. I was in Scotland for three years doing my doctoral work. I, um, every other summer, I'm at least six weeks in Australia New Zealand. And then on the other year, it's every other year, I'm the same in South Africa. So it's... Um, so, th and that's intentional because part of what I'm uh, trying to do is to get a glimpse of what's going on globally in the world. You know, uh, the center and the seminary aren't just connected to the United States. We're actually an international ministry in many ways. And so that background is important. And Rodney shares the same variety of mm -hmm. experience as well, of course. So uh, many of our faculty share that background, et cetera, and bring that perspective to the classroom. And it's a helpful perspective because it keeps us from being um, too nationalized, if I can say it that way. And there are lots of uh, organizations around the world in which, you know, the adjective is more important than the noun. You know, if I, if I were to say, oh, uh, say Russian Orthodoxy or something like that, you know, the, the adjective becomes more important than the than what's believed, and and that's really uh, a, a danger to the unity of the church globally that we have to be sensitive to as we minister. So you mentioned Rodney uh, has spent many years overseas as well. He spent his formative years in Ethiopia and Germany as well. And Rodney, you've taught in Kenya. You've worked in Zimbabwe. Uh, here in the States, in New York City, you worked with diplomats from all over the world. What are the kinds of common issues that have come up uh, in your ministry and, and even in your classes as you teach uh, cross-cultural leadership development? Well, I think it, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bach explained it uh, from a from a theoretical standpoint of the plates that are rubbing against each other. Mm -hmm. But when you translate that into people rubbing against each other, no matter where you live in the world, um, there's tension and uh, change requires it. Uh, you cannot have change and growth without some kind of tension that makes you grow. And I think God wants us to be... Um, not, not agents to try to keep everything the way it always was, you know, and, and go back to the good old days or whatever. I don't think they were that good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's funny when you, when you talk about uh, uh, the things that we experienced as, uh, as, as, as we were growing up, it kind of shows how old we are, uh, Daryl, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you think about it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the millennials, the Gen Z, the Gen X's, uh, the, the, uh, all these generations that have come after us, and, and each one of them has had to face this in a different way. So not only do you have different cultures, you have layers of culture uh, that you have to deal with, like a matrix. And uh, I believe that God wants us to become multicultural people. Uh, Paul could speak probably, you know, five, maybe six languages, but there's 5,000 languages. You know, you can't learn them all. And, you know, when he went to Laodicea in Acts 14, they didn't understand the Laodicean language and made a huge difference in the, the speed with which they could communicate. So I found that uh, when you're in a cross-cultural setting, you learn to slow down. You learn to listen. You learn to... Uh, kind of feel the situation and sense hey, what's going on here before you jump in, you know, with all guns blazing your mouth in, in gear as, as the ugly American can do from time to time. And uh, you learn to assess situations and look for an insider who can help you to kind of determine, okay, what's really going on here? Yeah, I call that slow thinking, you know, the, the, um, and, I, and the uh, two points I make in any cross-cultural conversation is the first thing you want to do is ask a lot of questions. You yeah. know, you want to you want to get a, kind of a reading on on where a person's coming from, what's driving them, et cetera. And the second thing I say is and you want to put your your doctrinal meter on mute. You know that you don't you don't want to just respond with the first thing that comes to your mind in rebuttal. You actually are trying first to understand the person before you engage with the ideas coming from the person, because there might be 
underlying elements of what is driving a person to be drawn towards what they are thinking that it would be important to know as you think about addressing the things that concern uh, the person you're having the conversation with. And mm -hmm. I can give you an example of that in that I pastored a, a Korean church in New Haven uh, for a year. And uh, at the end of the year, the, the elders came to me as a Presbyterian church and said, we like you. We, we want you to do more. And I said, well, no, I have a full time job. I'm just doing this on the side. I can't. And they said, no, you don't say no to us. Hmm. You know, you know, that shames that causes shame and you, you cannot uh, just directly say no. You have to, to, you know, be a little more subtle. And I said it again. <laughs> I, a good, a good I said it again. I said it two times and uh, I was replaced uh, within two <laughs> Wow. Because I didn't understand the shame honor hmm. aspect of saying no to, my, to the elders of the church um, and how that is done. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, you, you can learn two ways. You can learn by making mistakes or you can learn by listening quietly and, uh, you know, slowing down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the bumps that come from listening quietly, <laughs> slowing yeah. down a lot better than I do the, the mistakes. Although yeah, I, like, it's gonna I, be lots, right? I like to say that hard places are God's spaces. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. when you think about change that, um, that in the, in the, and the challenge of interacting with someone who thinks differently than you do, and how do you how do you get along with someone who's in that uh, situation? How do you represent your own life and convictions well in the midst of that? I mean, that really is the challenge of our current cultural situation. When the culture was more monolithic, that was easier to do than it is now, and that's certainly one of the major changes that has come in our lifetime. I mean, the, the world is bigger and smaller simultaneously. There are more people in it, but we're also more tightly connected to one another. There's a lot more communication than there used to be. We're a lot more aware of the alternative ways of living in various religions, et cetera. That's, we're all much more exposed to that than we were when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And the part of the difference of the generations and their attitude towards things is, is that what Rodney and I had to adjust to as this came into our world in some ways younger people have lived with from day one and they've been around it constantly uh, they've gone to school with that variety a variety that I certainly didn't go to school with my kids who've been out of school now for uh, a couple of decades had much more variety in their classroom than I ever had mm -hmm. and so that that just that presence uh, forces you to come to grips at a personal level with things that otherwise would be theoretical or that you learn through a book and it's not the same. Mm -hmm. So we've mentioned the the loss of that Judeo-Christian net that we've seen in, in so many places, uh, not only in America but in other places around the world. We mentioned the variety of different cultures. We're not just dealing with one culture. We have variety of cultures and demographics and Thanks, Rodney, for mentioning Gen X. People tend to forget about us. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why it's Gen X. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> the invisible generation. Thank yeah. you for uh, mentioning us. But um, in the book, Daryl, you talk about a variety of scripture passages that we can go to as we think about how do we engage better in this pluralistic world. And uh, one of the verses, one of my favorite verses, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, one of our favorite texts I know, uh, of course, that popular apologetics verse that people memorize, um, to be prepared always to give an answer uh, for the reason, for the hope that we have in Jesus, but to do it with gentleness and respect. I really appreciate how you've helped me to see the broader context of that verse and how it relates to more effective cultural engagement. So could you unpack that for us? Yeah, I'll try and do this quickly. Um, verse 13 says, basically, you know, you shouldn't get, you shouldn't catch any flack for having done anything uh, for have doing things right you know it's like what we teach our kids you know do right and things will go well mm -hmm. uh, then the next verse reminds us but we aren't in a normal world we're in a fallen world mm -hmm. so it basically says if something should go wrong even though you're doing right you know um, you're blessed and you're not to fear those from whom it is coming the injustice the abuse etc which I think is important because sometimes I think the church responds out of fear and out of a out, out of a sense that they don't control what's going on which of course they don't mm -hmm. uh, um, 
And, and so, so that's the second step. Then you get your passage, you know, be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you. The thing I like about that verse is when Peter has the choice of boiling everything that he believes down to one word, that word is hope. Mm-hmm. You know, the good news is hope. It's a positive message. Sometimes when we're communicating the culture, all we have to say is pretty negative. And I like to say, in the effort to, to talk about the challenge of what the gospel is to people's lives at one level, we never extend the invitation and the hope that comes out of it that's why it's called good news. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be able to be sure that as we communicate with the culture, we're always in the midst of whatever challenge might be going on, we, that we also extend this invitation that is the heart of the gospel, the idea that you can be restored to a healthy relationship with God. So that mm-hmm. takes us through verse 15. Of course, the tone of it with gentleness and meekness is Mm -hmm. wrapped around not only that passage but several other texts about how we're supposed to engage. Then it goes on to mention the abuse again. And, and and then it, it turns to the example, and the example for the abuse is the life of Christ, that he, as a just person, suffered for the unjust. And then there's a twist in the passage that's very important, and that twist is that uh, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring you to God, not them to God. And the point of that part of the passage is, is that we should never forget where we came from, that when we reach out to someone who doesn't embrace the Christian truth and doesn't embrace the Christian gospel, we're really start, they're starting out in the same place we started out from, and we should never forget that, that we didn't come naturally to where we are. It's by God's grace that we came to where we are, and that when we follow the example of Christ who reached out to those who did disagree with Him, who didn't think they needed God, who were separated from God, we're actually making the same move towards others that Christ made towards us. And if you remember that, that should change the way you interact with the person you're disagreeing with, Mm -hmm. because you're doing it on the basis of the grace of God, the approach of God to that person, the example that God has set about how to approach that person, etc. And then the best thing we have going for us is to live out the character of our faith and the character of our God as we do it. And if we do that well, then hopefully we'll be pointing to the hope that the gospel represents. Now, I did that about as quickly as I can. <laughs> I'm watching Rodney smile while I'm doing it. So uh, anyway, uh, that's that's how uh, – that's – First Peter three fifteen and its environs. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, you think about the way that God reached out to us before we cared a thing about Him or His message, and you know it, it's so difficult for us, especially you look at so- social media online. You just see people just just reacting, not doing that slow thinking that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important that we uh, remember that and that we uh, give give that same kind of that same kind of engagement as well. Now, Rodney, years ago, you might remember, you led a chapel activity that highlighted some of the differences in how DTS students experience the world. And talk to us a little bit about the value of recognizing different life experiences and that how that relates to engaging in difficult conversations. Yeah, we uh, did a privilege walk where basically we lined everybody up in chapel and uh, had them take a step forward if they had uh, experienced uh, a blessing, actually, uh, in their life. And uh, uh, it showed the separation between, uh, you know, kind of the haves and the have-nots, the people who have had a lot. And I've, I've done some thinking about that, actually, since then. And I realized that, you know, the fact that you've been privileged, for instance, my dad and my mom were married for 67 years. Hmm. And that has been a tremendous privilege in my life. And the the responsibility I have is what am I going to do with the privilege once I recognize that not everybody has a mom and dad who were married for 67 years. Mm -hmm. And, and, And that's the issue. The issue is what do we do with what we are privileged with? But that exercise was a, was a fun uh, kind of uh, a practical way of helping people see um, that some have had privileges and that others have not had. Mm-hmm. And how does the that help? The okay. interesting thing about that exercise, Mikkel, was is that we d- we did it initially in Lamb Auditorium, which wasn't big enough to do it in. Yeah, <laughs> and we lined everybody up, and as it was happening, I realized 
You know, there isn't as much of a spread here as you would normally see because we're all we're dealing with graduate students who yeah, just right. to be graduate students mm -hmm. were already in a highly privileged space. Yeah. Which was interesting to see. So we redid it. We redid it in the in the quad, you know, between the new Horner building, the library and and uh, and Todd, so that those who are on campus will know what I'm talking about, the grassy area there. This area we drew a line down the middle and we did it again so we had more space to work with. And we still got some of the same results, but you know, sometimes an exercise like that is criticized as being um, politically imbalanced or something like that but that's not the purpose of it if you if you think through a parable like the parable of the good samaritan mm -hmm. or you think through the part of the new testament where the example of christ is you know he emptied himself and took on humanity to connect with people what you're trying to do is to explore the fact that people don't have the same experiences they don't have the same blessings and challenges in relationship to each other and when you can see that and show that and help people to see that and show that in relationship to one another in relationship in the context of a chapel of the people they're going to class with mm. um, then you then you you open up the possibility for conversations about what people's lives are like what God has done in their life what they've learned from what they've been through etc and it can be a very very positive eye-opening community building experience mm -hmm. to see that going on and that's why I was so pleased when when Rodney and I worked on doing this together because because we were trying to illustrate for students and make them aware that the experience that I have isn't necessarily the experience of the person sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would say this, too. Um, Daryl, you and I had known of each other for, you know, 10, 15 years. But it wasn't until that day you called me and said, hey, I've got a meeting I need to go to, and I'm supposed to bring a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I consider you a friend. And I've, I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> I didn't know I was Daryl Bach's friend. But we went to that meeting, and it was actually a racial uh, reconciliation meeting where blacks and whites were meeting and sharing over a dinner together. And, uh, and really, that's where our friendship uh, really took off. And then we, we started going to baseball games together and doing other things uh, with our families. And then you moved away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, hey, but we got a good baseball team here. That's exactly right. Well, that's good. Yeah, well, if I ever get in a plane again. Anyway, you uh, know, and, and Rodney's making a key point here. What happened was is that we were in, you know, one of the ways in which you bridge these gaps that we're talking about culturally is to build that interpersonal relationship on yeah. a one to one level with someone whose background is distinct from your own getting to know what their life has been about what they've gone through etc and um, you know some of the people who've been on the table know that we've had Tony Evans on as well on many occasions and we've talked very openly about uh, some of the issues related to race etc but it's because we have that friendship and we've built that trust mm -hmm. that we're able to have the conversation at the level at which it almost has to operate to get anywhere mm -hmm. and unfortunately a lot of people have never had the experience of being of developing a relationship with someone close to them whose background may or may not be like theirs at all mm -hmm. and and uh, and and where they can ask you know what the different kind of experience is things like you know what is the talk you know uh, well we don't we don't have a talk in my culture but virtually anyone in the african-american culture has what's known as the talk uh, and what what, what generates that and that kind of thing and and so all these issues are kind of interwoven together and particularly in a Christian context it should not be difficult to build those bridges and to work and to be able to work in that space because ultimately the the thing that ultimately connects us tightly to one another is our shared commitment in ministry and our shared commitment to Christ that uh, that has drawn us to one another and gets us to appreciate what God has done in each one of our lives Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what you're talking about with listening and getting to know the other person, on the one level, it sounds so simple, and yet people don't take the time to 
to do that, especially on social media. Somebody puts out an opinion and and they're just slammed right away. And you're like, you don't even know the person, you know. Mm -hmm. And if we begin to think more about putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes, I think we can we can see um, some of that cultural uh, conversation uh, be more healthy. And I would I actually take part as proximity breeds relationship. Hmm. You've got to get into the lives of other people and love. The love of Christ is what draws us together. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this social media is, is bitter. It's, 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 uh, it's really not, not very pleasant. Uh, but when you start talking about loving people and wanting to, to you know, see their best, uh, that, that's a, a, a magnetic pull that brings people together. I don't think you can really disciple people if you're if you're not uh, willing to enter into their lives and and to to walk in their shoes you know you'll always have a superficial mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. now rodney i took part in those those two chapels that uh you and daryl were talking about and i remember the first one before you introduced even the concept of privilege you read philippians 2 3 to 8 about the importance of looking out for the interests of others going into the famous Christological hymn and the one that highlights Jesus' humility. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you see that passage playing into how we as Christians should engage in a pluralistic world. You know, it's really not tolerance. I mean, tolerance is like the, the entry level, you know, that's the ABCs. Yeah. What we're really talking about is, um, is engaging, engaging with people. And that's going to require more than just getting along. You, you've got to really love each other. And in order to do that, you need to be able to look for ways to disadvantaging yourself for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel. And, uh, and that's what, what, what it's really talking about is that, hey, if you have to suffer, you have to go through some difficulties in order to get this message out, in order to communicate it to people so that they understand it then so be it. Uh, I tell my students in class, um, I'm not here to make you happy. <laughs> I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to make you uncomfortable mm. and to get comfortable with being uncomfortable mm. because growing requires some kind of discomfort. Um, it's just, it just doesn't happen without some kind of um, I I equilibrium being upset in terms of of holding everything the way that you want and i think from being uh, a, a world traveler as well as a missionary you just get used to being mm -hmm. uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a lot of different situations and and learn to what i call drag and breathe okay when you drag and breathe it means that you you feel uncomfortable you know that you're in uh, a, an uncomfortable place but you take four, 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 four counts in, and then you, you let out eight counts. And it's, it's not easy to let out eight counts, but what it does, it just, it, it quiets your heart. It prepares you for what you're about to experience. And you just say a, a quick prayer, oh Lord, be with me. Mm -hmm. And you get ready to, to dive in there. Yeah. yeah, and the h hard thing about being in an unfamiliar space is, and this is another important idea, is that a lot of people do things differently. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a better or worse way to do something. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the world that would be unfamiliar or awkward to a particular individual because someone has grown up in a context where things are done differently, and it's not necessarily a good or bad difference. It's just a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think when you recognize that, one of the things that happens from traveling globally is that you walk into these different cultural bubbles, if I'll say it that way, mm -hmm. and the rules change change uh, they don't work the way things in you know things in Germany didn't work the way things work in the United States in Germany you know everything's done by a stempel a stamp and the bureaucrat runs the way the world operates because the Germans are highly organized and I used to joke about this when I was in Germany in fact I opened one of my sermons by talking about the my, my lessons of living with the with the reality of the stempel and all the approvals that you needed to do anything and all the bureaucratic stuff you had to hoops you had to 
jump through. And I realize it's just a different way that people have organized their lives to try and make their lives work. It isn't that it's better or worse. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we get locked in to the way we're used to doing things and think that's the only way that thing can be accomplished. And in fact, that's not often not the case. And sometimes by learning what motivates that difference, um, you get the opportunity to look at your own way you've structured your life from the outside a little bit, which can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And you also get to understand the rationale for why someone would do it differently from the inside, which is helpful. And all of a sudden, you've got uh, you've grown. You you've you've come to see that there are, in some cases, many ways to skin the cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in that process, uh, you learn that that some skin skinning uh, might be different or better, mm -hmm. and some skin just is just the way different way people do things, and that's okay. Yeah, you know, I was born in Illinois, but grew up in the Philippines, and uh, my parents were at the Campus Crusade. And then when I came to uh, California to go to school, I had to, you know, there's a lot of humility that goes into that because mm -hmm. I, I used to say a lot. Uh, pardon my ignorance, but what is this common thing that everybody was talking about, right? Because I didn't grow up uh, in the United States. And then I was a missionary with the Baptist General Conference in the Philippines, and I'd have to do the same thing in the Filipino language, being a Filipino guy. And people are like, why is this Filipino dude like walking around like he doesn't know what's going on <laughs> in this place, you know? Um, but, you know, you, you find those friends, you find those uh, people who are going to be able to, to be your cultural informants and uh, mm -hmm. help you navigate. And it really takes a lot of humility. And, um, yeah, very, all, all good ideas. Daryl, you know. We, dis we discussed oh, this in class this last weekend. I was teaching cross-cultural communication. And uh, we, we were discussing this whole idea of American exceptionalism, hmm. which is the concept that somehow or other God has... Uh, has blessed uh, uh, America beyond any other country, and and I, I admit, you know, that we we have been blessed. But uh, does that mean that we are superior to every other country of the world that also may feel God's blessing uh, at uh, at certain times? And uh, we ha we really had to wrestle with that because some of the students had been taught from the time they were young children that to be American is to be God's people. It, it's almost as if we were Israel and uh, we were the 10 lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> and we, we've, been brought, we've been brought home. Um, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, you know, all these things that kind of give us... This, yep. yeah, mm -hmm. Manifest Destiny. Yeah, Manifest Destiny. Yeah, those things that give us this feel that somehow we are superior people and that no one else could possibly love their country the way we love ours. Uh, Man, if you start out with that, you're not going to get very far in, in a multicultural setting. Um, you know, you really kind of have to even the playing field and, and allow people to uh, kind of, uh, you know, have their own cultural pride. And you're the outsider. You're the other, uh, mm -hmm. as, as Hegel uh, describes it, uh, as the uh, capital O-T-H-E-R. You are the other who is seeking to share something within that culture that you want to share, which is the gospel. And, and uh, the question is, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to be able to communicate mm -hmm. that message in a cross-cultural setting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the danger of a manifest destiny approach is, is that it can alleviate our sense of need for God. We may think that the culture, it, it, the, that the culture becomes that which defines us, that yeah. where our identity lies, yeah. that which uh, directs us, that kind of thing, and it and it and it impinges upon our relationship with God, and it certainly risks impinging our appreciation of other believers yeah. who come from other places and other countries with other ha customs and that kind of thing, and, and it t it can take away from us. Um, the desire and the interest and the curiosity of being a good learner in those relationships that we've been talking about. So there's a lot that gets risked 
when we when we push uh, i'm back to the point i was making earlier in some ways which is sometimes the adjective is more important than the noun you know when we talk about american christianity for example if it's more important to be american than to be a christian mm -hmm. then something is out of whack especially and now i'm going to have some fun when if you look for the words united states in the bible you're going to keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I once read this this very fringe commentary that that put America as the uh, eagle who gave the wings to the women in Revelation. <laughs> you know, like, oh wow! No, so I have seen this on the mission field. I've seen ethnocentrism. I've seen reverse ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism, and the people that they've ministered to, and the stress that's that's put on the relationship and on on ministry there. Um, now, Rodney mentioned the Apostle Paul earlier, and I wanted to at least come back to that before we, we come to the end of our time here. Because, Daryl, when I first started my involvement uh, with the Hendrick Center and, and our mentorship, one of the first things we talked about was how the Apostle Paul engaged the culture. And there are a lot of lessons to learn from that. It actually inspired me to write a series of blog posts about it. But talk about just a few key lessons we can take away from Paul's example of cultural engagement. Well, I have a message that I give. It's called Back to the Future, in which the argument is, is that uh, as, as our culture shifts and becomes more diverse, and of course, one of the things that I haven't that we haven't said that's important, we've alluded to it, is in different parts of the world, the Judeo-Christian net never existed and never has existed. So we're, we're talking about a peculiar situation here. That's part of the plate tectonics I was talking about. Our culture and our cultures have certain features that other culture and other cultures in other parts of the world do not have. So that's, that's the first observation to make. So Paul is this figure trying to introduce Christianity. He has no cultural power. He has no political power to speak of. There isn't any national organization that he belongs to at the political social level in the larger culture that gives him any credibility whatsoever. You know, he's operating as a great religious independent with a new thing that's just sprung up, even though it has Judeo roots in Judaism. So, you know, so all the cultural crutches that Christianity functions in today in our context with that history, with that social power, with that political power, etc., didn't exist for him, and yet he was very effective. Mm. So the question is, how do you deal with that? And my and the premise of this is, as we move away from a culture that has those props, those crutches, how can you effectively function in the culture if you're in a situation in which your 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 other supportive elements like your politics and and your social status and that kind of thing aren't tied to your Christian identity? How does that work? So the message called Back to the Future. And so on the one hand, I talk about how Paul talks very directly with Christians about the nature of the culture so they can understand um, understand how, how problematic living in a fallen world is and what that means. That's your end of Romans 1. You know, you read through that section, and I read through the end of Romans 1, and I go, I think Paul has been watching my 10 o'clock news all his life, mm -hmm. you know? Um, there's nothing he's describing there that I don't see in my world today. And he's very direct about it, and he's and, and, and very, not just direct, but almost shockingly direct. I mean, if someone reads that who identifies with the culture, man, they feel challenged and slapped down in some ways. So it's a very direct passage. Yet the odd thing is, and this is the lesson, when you watch him address that culture in Acts 17, Okay, and in fact, the passage in which he addresses that culture at Mars Hill in Acts 17 actually begins by saying, and he went around looking at the idols and was provoked by what he saw, which means his blood pressure changed. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't like the idolatry that he was surrounded with. He didn't like what he was seeing in the culture. But he begins his address to that very audience by saying, I see that you're very religious. And when I read that verse with that tone and that way in, I ask, I go, Paul, I'm a child of the 60s, I go, Paul, what have you been smoking? I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, how in the world would you address 
that situation that way with that kind of openness. And really what he's saying is this. He's trying to build a bridge. And the bridge he's trying to build is, I see that you're engaged with a lot of interest in spiritual things. Now, underneath his thinking, he's going, now you couldn't be approaching this in a more dangerous way, a more problematic way. But I see you're interested in spiritual things. So let's talk about it for a while. Let's have the let's have a conversation in this area. And then he steps in and he doesn't step in tiptoeing and saying, "Oh, I really like your idols. They're really nice." And you know, that one on the corner over there, I, I that's a cute-looking god. I mean, no. He he walks in and, and he says, "You know, God can't be contained by what we design to represent him." And he puts, and you and I, Mikhail, we've talked about this a lot, the uh, tactics of Greg Kunkel. He puts a rock in their shoe. You know, a rock is this thing that you put in a, you know, when it comes in your shoe, it bugs you and it stays with you until you either pull off your shoe and pull it out or you resolve, you know, resolve why it's there. So he's doing these little things to give pause. So he shows respect for the culture on the one hand and opens up in building a bridge to where they are coming from. He's starting with where they are coming from. Mm -hmm. He isn't as direct, but he doesn't give up on the challenge either. And there's this wonderful balance between trying to take them to the invitation, okay, because he's headed towards resurrection in his speech, trying to take them to the, resur to the resurrection and the invitation on the one hand, but he's challenging them in spots, but the way he's challenging them is, is what I call giving them pause. He's asking them to think about the way they are thinking about spirituality and ask, mm -hmm. is that the best way to think about spirituality? Mm -hmm. And he's opened himself up for a conversation by doing that. And so I don't think we do enough of that. You know, our tendency in interacting with the culture is to shake our finger at it, to say, um, you're wrong, this is the way, you know, this is, this is wrong thinking, etc. Rather than putting that rock in the shoe, speaking mm -hmm. with respect to the culture as you challenge them, mm -hmm. even even though deep down in your soul you know there are problems to deal with that are very, very serious. And yeah. getting that balance right in, in sharing, that tension between challenge and invitation so that mm -hmm. invitation never goes away, and respect, gentleness, and meekness never goes away, even in the midst of being direct, but speaking about culture in one way, but speaking to the culture in a different way, understanding that difference of tone is very, very important in cultural engagement. Yeah. And, and I would say this, uh, if I could, uh, that um, it also applies to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Exactly. <laughs> you have got to treat each other with that same kind of respect that you are, you know, that Paul's talking about in Acts, Acts 17, mm -hmm. and he explains more in First Corinthians nine, where he says, "Look, I have, I have uh, a right. I have a right to get my living from the gospel, but because of your attitudes, uh, I am not going to use that right because you guys are you guys are so immature." And so, even in dealing with Christians, um, he gives up his rights as a as an apostle in order to be able to speak into their lives and to have a conversation. And I, I think Paul valued conversations. I mean, I think he really valued being able to, to, to speak into people's lives and not speak into others. And if it meant giving up one of his rights in order to do that, it's out of here. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to let it go. And so I would come back to what I said earlier is that we have to look for ways that we can be disadvantaged uh, in order to reach out to others, you know, look for things that are keeping us from, from being able to connect with other people and be willing to let those things go. And of course, that's not an easy thing. That's not mm -hmm. an American cultural individualist uh, kind of idea. But it's something that it, it requires the power of the Holy Spirit yeah. uh, working in and through us to enable us to say, hey, I give up my rights. You know, it, if you'll listen to me and let me talk and have we can have a conversation, I'll let my rights go. And the whole second half of Jesus' ministry with his disciples basically said, look, 
if I'm catching flack for doing this for God, you're going to catch flack for doing this for God too. You can be absolutely sure of that. I sometimes think we whine too much about the way the world pushes back on us because it isn't a surprise. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the whole, the, almost, the uh, second half of almost every gospel takes disciples there and says, you know, you're going to have to bear your cross, not bear your cross, you know, once every five years, mm -hmm. okay? You're going to have to bear your cross daily, okay? That's looking at a pushback that's going to come from stepping into this space and trying to represent God well. And then the question is, do we do this with a, with a, with a vulnerability that is like the way Christ made himself vulnerable, vulnerable enough that he ended up on a cross. Yeah. And this, and we're back to the First Peter 3 passage. Mm -hmm. The reason we're able to suffer this injustice is because we know that we're modeling and walking down the same path that our Savior walked down. And we also appreciate the fact that when he walked down that path, he was rescuing people like us. You know, he came for all of us, you know, and 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 no one is an exception. Another thing I like to say and when you're in Luke 4 and it says Jesus came to release the blind and the captive and the oppressed, okay, and we tend to think of the blind, the captive, and the oppressed as other people, you know? No, 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 no. We were the blind. We were the captive. We were the oppressed. He came for all of us. Yeah. And it's appreciating that element of what we have experienced from the grace of God and how he has lifted us up that makes us care about the people who still need to be lifted up and who can be encouraged that God is willing to lift them up and had loved them enough to lift them up if they will pay attention to what it is that God is doing. And so that invitation, that good news, that hope needs to always be in our minds as we're engaging with people and sharing with them because if you care about them as people you will care about the hope that god offers to people amen amen well guys thank you so much for being with us our time is entirely gone uh we could continue talking about this uh more but i will direct people to daryl to daryl's book um cultural intelligence living for god in a diverse pluralistic world and Daryl, thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure, as always. Rodney, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. And we thank you as well for joining us on the table today. We'd encourage you to subscribe to the podcast, and we hope you'll see us. Uh, we will see you again next time on the table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to the Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu/thetable. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.